Everybody ready? Good morning. My name is uh, Bob Parker. I'm the uh, chief of geriatrics in uh, family and community medicine. We have two divisions of geriatrics, one in internal medicine led by Dr. Michael Lincolnstein and one in family medicine. Our uh, clinical program is over at uh, Christa Santa Rosa Northwest. We have a <coughs> clinic for the frail elders in Tower One, and we also run a uh, acute care unit for the elderly called the ACE unit in Christa Santa Rosa Northwest in the first floor. In addition, we have uh, five nursing homes that we uh, medical directors at. So this morning, I want to talk to you about why we get older. Why do we age? Is there an alternative? How do we age? It seems to be inevitable. Everybody we know gets older. One of the objectives that we're going to talk about today is defining aging, discuss some of the major theories of aging, describe the changes that occur with aging, and we'll discuss this concept of reserve capacity. And we'll look at specific organ systems and see how they age. So how old would you be if you didn't know how old you are? Said Satchel Paige. He was a black baseball player back in the 30s when Baseball had not been integrated. And when you think about that, that's a fairly intelligent uh, question. Age is really a matter of function rather than a matter of chronology. So if we didn't know how old we are, some of us might feel old at 40. Some of us may feel young at 80. I want to explain the difference between two words that are commonly interchanged, one life expectancy and the other lifespan. Human lifespan really hasn't changed in the last several hundred years, but of course life expectancy has. In 1900, life expectancy at birth was only 49 years of age. This is uh, the record holder for living the most years on this planet, John Calvin. She was 122 years and 164 days old when she passed. She rode a bicycle up until she was 100. I also read that she smoked a few cigarettes every day, too. She might have lived longer if it wasn't for that. <laughs> This is the curve of life expectancy since 1900. And this is the timeline here up to about 2050 years of life. And you can see there's been a fairly steady increase. Females doing better than males in terms of life expectancy. Most of the improvement that we've seen is due to improved sanitation and improved healthcare organizations, and that sort of thing. The point of this slide, although it looks rather complicated, is uh, comparing life expectancy to income. We have a per capita income on this quarter, oops, and this axis here, and income inequality here in deaths per 100,000. If we look back here in the back, these are the worst uh, quartiles. In the front, the people that have the most money and live in the, most, in the best neighborhoods actually live the longest and the healthiest. So one of the biggest determinants in our country about life uh, expectancy is your annual income. There are some national differences, too, that are somewhat disturbing that we've all heard about in our country. Uh, this was life expectancy up to 2002 in 13 countries. And you can see the United States is only worse than Mexico 
We have Australia, France, Germany, Hong Kong, Italy, Japan, Canada, Switzerland, all of them doing better than we are. So here's an interesting comparison on maximum life uh, span between species. We have mice uh, at four years, and these are laboratory animals, the mice in their home don't live to be four years old. But this is the maximum life span of, uh, of an animal. We're down to bowhead whales, which can live up to 211 years. And generally the pattern is the larger the animal, the longer they tend to live, humans being somewhat of the exception. Although we're catching up. And I want to make a distinction between extrinsic aging and intrinsic aging. Extrinsic aging is that that happens outside of the organism, external pressures, uh, famine, uh, sun, uh, natural disasters, uh, intrinsic aging or conditions that occur inside the cell or inside the organ. So how would we define aging? Uh, one of the official definitions I found is that aging is usually defined as a progressive loss of function accompanied by decreasing fertility and increasing mortality with advancing age. The definition I like is aging is the loss of homeostasis. Homeostasis means the ability to maintain your internal environment. Everybody knows grandma has more trouble keeping her body temperature constant. She has to have her room at 85 degrees. And she gets cold when everybody else is comfortable. That's just one example. We'll talk about more of it later. Characteristics of aging, I'll go through this really fast, so I'm get to the interesting part. After maturation, mortality keeps increasing. We have a decreased ability to maintain our internal environment. This is considered by most experts to be the single hallmark of aging. Examples are temperature regulation, fluid balance, we have trouble concentrating our urine, uh, the list goes on and on. We have a progressive decrease in our reserve physiologic capacity. We get an increased vulnerability to many diseases, primarily malignancies, cardiovascular disease, and infections. So what are some of the theories of aging? Why do we get older? A couple of the uh, major ones are evolutionary, the free radical theory, cellular aging, genetic, and accumulation of waste products. We'll talk about evolutionary biology of aging first. You would think that there might be some hereditary advantage to uh, living longer. Uh, you know, your parents live to be in their 90s. I'm going to live to be in my mind. Unfortunately, it's probably not true. There's no selective survival advantage from an evolutionary point of view beyond the time that it's necessary to reproduce and raise our offspring. After that, the parents are not needed. No selection pressure against genes that have bad effects later in life particularly if they're advantageous early in life. So if we have a particular gene that helps us raise our offspring and improve the survival of our species, that's going to be preserved even though we may find that that produces a malignancy later on. So the evolutionary theories then predict that there isn't a specific gene that promotes aging. Uh, aging's not programmed, it results largely 
from an accumulation of damage to the organ and to the cell, owing to limited investments in maintenance repair. Longevity is thus regulated by genes that control the levels of activities such as DNA repair and antioxidants. The free radical theory is uh, probably the most popular one now. It's related to struggling with this thing. Is that working for you guys? Uh, it's related to oxidative stress. And uh, this is the accumulation of damage to large macromolecules, primarily from free radicals. Uh, we also see gene insertions that increase uh, certain enzyme systems, uh, the superoxide dismutase and catalases, particularly in fruit flies that uh, increase lifespan. So that sort of supports this uh, free radical theory. But in human trials, we don't find that antioxidants really delay aging. Caloric restriction, uh, everybody's heard about if you starve a mouse and get them down to about 60% of a ad-lib diet, they will get a 30 to 40% increase in their average and maximum lifespan. It retards the age-related changes. It's most effective right after the weaning. It's still significant when compared to uh, other to the mice that have caloric intake, greater caloric intake, and are exercised. Uh, what studies have been done in primates so far do not show that this works in primates. I have a retired friend who's a neurosurgeon that has been restricting his caloric intake for a number of years. And I keep teasing him that uh, it probably doesn't work that he may as well go ahead and enjoy himself. <laughs> uh, he's still exercising and he's still uh, thin, although he looks uh, rather frail because of it. He almost looks uh, kakexic because you have to really restrict a lot of calories. Interestingly, there are actually societies in our culture where people are, uh, and, and you can Google this on websites where they're actually supporting each other in caloric restriction. Now, cellular aging is another theory. Hayflick, back in the 50s, demonstrated that there is a certain maximum number of divisions that a cell, in this case fibroblasts, could undergo before they went apoptosis, before they had uh, programmed cell death. And that was around 50 to 70 divisions. So what happened was the telomeres, the little uh, caps on the end of your chromosomes, get shorter every time the cell divides. And when they get to the end, apparently, cell death is initiated. Programmed cell death or apoptosis. Supporting this theory is progeria patients, kids that have uh, rapid aging, have very short telomeres. They lose their proliferative potential. There's a slower rate of repair as we get older because these cells are uh, unable to divide as fast as they could. And we can see this in uh, tissue cultures. The genetic theory of aging, um, there are certain individuals uh, in, and I think there's one village in Italy where the men typically will live into their 90s. And they've identified a particular gene, a single nucleotide polymorphism, that seems to be responsible for that. And that probably is just luck more than anything else. But there are some that are associated with uh, longevity. We see mutations in fruit flies and in the flatworms that can dramatically increase or decrease lifespan. Most are related 
to the defense against stressors, like heat, ultraviolet damage, and free radicals. So this theory really says lifespan is programmed before birth. So take your pick. Waste product theory basically means that the garbage keeps accumulating intracellularly until that particular cell uh, undergoes programmed death. And there is a pigment that we call lipofusion, which is a cellular inclusion that we can uh, see under the microscope, and it occurs as a result of self-digestion of the cell and other processes. Probably is an end product of free radical induced peroxidation. So let's move on now. The Danish twin study, I think the Danes have kept records of identical twins for over a hundred years. And many, many studies have been uh, done on this database. And when you look at this study, one of the papers uh, that came out of this study showed that genetics accounted for only about 25% of the variation in longevity. Whereas apparently the environment accounts for 50%. And that would include uh, natural disasters, uh, infectious diseases, that sort of thing. The other 25% is probably uh, luck. It's struck by lightning, run over by a car, uh, accidents, and so forth. Other papers in this database, from this database, show that organs in the same person age with varying rates. Your liver may be getting older faster than your heart. So, they find that normal aging looks more like a chronic disease. And there's still debate about aging, whether it's a natural process or a disease. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about rapamycin, which is a antifungal agent that was discovered in the Easter Islands back in the 1950s, and uh, initially was used as an immunosuppressant for transplants we currently are using it to coat our coronary artery stents. But it was also found to uh, mimic caloric restriction in uh, mice and was able to prolong life uh, span in healthy mice by 30 to 40%. Same with uh, fruit flies and worms. So that's a pretty impressive feat. And it works by working on two receptors. Uh, in the intracellular, the mTOR receptor is the mammalian target of rapamycin. And there's one receptor for growth and proliferation, and another that uh, seems to stimulate program cell death. So the major effects of rapamycin to increase uh, clearing of dead cells, program cell death, decreasing cell growth and proliferation, and decreasing inflammation, and therefore decreases aging. So this is a major sensing pathway, and I think you may hear some more about this in some of the other talks later on. There have been lots and lots of studies on this. And you think, uh, wow, this is really great. We all want to be taking rapamycin. It's on the market now. But it's also an immunosuppressant. So it increases our risk of getting infection. It increases uh, certain other uh, risk of diseases also. So there's, this is a tantalizing area of research where if we could actually choose one or the other of these two receptors, we could manipulate certain disease and aging processes. 
but that remains to be seen. We're a long way from uh, doing any studies in human trials. So let's switch gears and look at how do we age with uh, specific organ systems, since each of our organs seem to get older at different rates. I want to talk about maintaining our internal milieu first. Uh, homeostenosis is sort of uh, a take on homeostasis. As we age, we lose the ability to compensate for uh, changes in the internal environment. So we see that with normal aging, we have a decreased ability to withstand stress over and challenges over time. When we're young, we can donate a kidney. And the other kidney works fine, seems to do the job. As you age, that physiologic capacity diminishes, and if you lose a kidney, that may be enough to put you into kidney failure. So that's the concept of physiologic reserves. We have more reserve as we're young. We have more reserves as we age that are progressively used. And then when we get an external stress, like pneumonia, suddenly we have respiratory failure and we're on a ventilator in the ICU instead of just being treated with antibiotics as an outpatient if you were a younger person. So all organs have functional reserves. The kidney can lose up to 75% of the nephrons, the functional unit in the kidney, before we even start seeing that creatinine go up. Creatinine is the waste product that we measure to estimate kidney function. So symptoms only begin to occur when the capacity is dropped to levels that affects that patient's activities. And we'll look at each organ with that in mind. For example, we were talking about thermal regulation. Grandma and grandpa likes to keep their room real hot. My father is 96 years old now. Lives in assisted living. His room is consistently at 85 degrees. Fortunately, he lives in Miami, Florida, and is outside most of the time. Well, maybe that's why everybody likes to retire in Florida. So we also have difficulty maintaining water balance. Kidney has trouble concentrating the urine. Uh, we have a decreased ability to sense thirst. So as we age, we're more vulnerable to dehydration. We have trouble with regulation of caloric intake. Appetite may decrease or increase. Taste buds change. Heart rate variability. We have more difficulty maintaining a constant heart rate. We talked about the kidneys concentrating ability. We also have trouble maintaining bone mass. We could go on and on with various examples. But let's look at each organ individually. The skin is obviously the most visible, and that's the one that everybody looks at to determine our age. So, are we as old as we look? Well, Cher is 67 years old now. She's on Medicare. She has Social Security. <laughs> she looks pretty good. And she's got a lot of makeup, a lot of plastic surgery. But even with that, she still looks pretty good. So, we aren't necessarily as old as we may look, or vice versa. There was a large uh, study in Copenhagen that showed that wrinkles and baldness in men did not predict a shorter lifespan. I was pleased to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> However, men that had no gray hair did have a slightly longer life expectancy. I don't know where you find men with no gray hair. <laughs> So, these are 
two extreme examples. The woman on the left is only 62 years old, and the man on the right is 91. So we don't look as old as we are, necessarily. The woman on the left is an American Indian that spent her whole life outdoors in the Southwest. The man on the right is a monk who spent his entire life indoors. And you can see the differences in the aging of their skin. Now, intrinsic aging is aging that is chronologic. We can't seem to stop this. We really don't have much control over the gravity, expression lines. We lose elasticity. The skin gets thinner. We get hormonal changes. We start getting these little blotches of vascular GDA injectasias and some yellowing. We get slower wound healing in our skin. These are normal uh, changes in aging that we really can't control. But we can control these. Extrinsic uh, aging, meaning those things that occur outside of the body, not the exaggerated. <clears throat> I mean, like uh, coarseness, uh, modeling, these sun damage from two injectages, actinic keratosis, deep wrinkles we see primarily from people that are smokers, particularly those that you see around the mouth. Uh, these are all caused by ultraviolet light, smoking, and other uh, external factors. You should use sunscreen every day. When you talk to your dermatologist, he says, put that on every morning. Particularly if you live in Texas. Okay, let's look at the heart system. As we age, we have a decreased maximal heart rate. So a decrease in maximal oxygen uptake, decrease in the functional reserve, although that occurs much slower in those that exercise. And I will propose to you that if there is a fountain of youth, it is exercise. Uh, arterial stiffness will commonly increase, but isn't necessarily inevitable. Now this complicated looking slide sort of demonstrates uh, what happens with the heart as we age, VO2 max is a measurement of uh, exercise capacity. And if you look on this scale, the higher the better. And over here on the horizontal scale is age. And let's uh, look at the sedentary group here. As they age, no matter how hard we try, when we're measuring the VO2 max, it progressively decreases in a linear fashion. However, those that are moderately active and those that are athletes experience a much slower change in the drop in their VO2 max. Now, just for an example, let's say, let's look at this line right here, and let's say that's a certain activity level. It might be just climbing stairs or playing golf. At some point, you're going to cross. You're going to cross this line, and these people that are sedentary will experience symptoms. These people will experience them much later, and the more fit may not experience them at all. So each of us have had that experience, probably. I know I have. I'm out of shape and I'm climbing stairs. I'm going to get short of breath after one or two flights. I've been working out. As I progressively improve my exercise tolerance, I have less and less trouble with that. Same goes on in the lung. Every year we lose about 20 to 40 milliliters of vital capacity. The amount of air that you can uh, blow out uh, is dropping every single year. If you're a smoker, it's almost two to three times that rate. So, to give you an example of this concept of physiologic reserve, <clears throat> I've had the experience of seeing patients that have uh, lung disease. <clears throat> Here's a guy who is in sedentary. He uh, really comes into the office because he can't play golf any longer. 
you had an episode of pneumonia and he thought he'd be back to the playing golf within a few weeks. And he couldn't. He complained of severe dyspnea with moderate exertion. So after the pulmonary function studies and chest x-ray were telling him he had severe emphysema, then he says, why? I didn't have any trouble playing golf before. Well, that's probably the most strenuous activity that he did. And he crossed that line that we were talking about. <clears throat> now, it was accelerated by the pneumonia that he had. But to many people, it seems like these things occur suddenly when it's been gradually going on for years, and it only affects them when it starts to affect their lifestyle. Now, if you've been a distant runner, or uh, an athlete, you would have noticed it much sooner. Same thing happens with the musculoskeletal system. You get a 30% decline in the muscle mass as we age from about 30 to 70. Uh, we have an associated decline in strength. The absolute number of muscle fibers decreases. It's partially reversible with exercise, even in the very, very old. <clears throat> but it's mostly an increase in the size of the individual fiber rather than increase in the number of fibers. As we were talking about earlier, as we age, even though our weight may not change, we might be the same 125 pounds, but there's a reversal of the fat to muscle ratio. When we're young, we're about 60% uh, muscle and 40% fat. And that's reversed as we age. Then, and that just seems to be a normal process of aging. The slow versus the fast twitch fibers change also. We have an increase in the slow twitch and fast twitch fibers seem to be the ones that go first. Uh, there's a prolonged contraction time. Maybe one of the reasons along with the lower threshold for firing that we tend to get cramps easier as we age. And probably one of the most important messages out today I think is that anabolic steroids really don't help the aging muscle. You know, we all see ads about low T, we need this, we need that, we need to be taking uh, anabolic steroids to keep us young. Uh, they don't work. Not in the aging muscle. The renal system, kidneys, as we said, continues to lose left lungs. For those of you that work with uh, patients that are looking at their creatinine clearance, their kidney function, it's important to understand that since uh, muscle mass is decreasing, creatinine is a product of the muscle. So the absolute amount of creatinine in the blood decreases. So we have to adjust our formula to measure creatinine clearance based on weight and sex and age. And that gives us a little bit more of an accurate uh, estimate of kidney function. We lose the ability to concentrate urine, which predisposes us to dehydration. We have trouble uh, limiting excretion of sodium, so we tend to run lower sodiums. Frequently we'll see elderly people with sodiums of 130 when normal is 140. They're more sensitive to drugs that lower sodium. Same with drugs that lower potassium. Problems with water balance, same thing. Bone. From age 40 to 80, 25 to 30% of bone was in women, 10 to 15% in men. Strong related in women to loss of estrogen and menopause. Our peak bone mass occurs about age 35. So if you start out uh, with a low bone mass, say you were anorexic or lived in a underserved or un impoverished country and didn't have adequate nutrition, you might uh, start out with a fairly low bone mass and then uh, be more susceptible to fractures than you know. On the left is a normal bone. This is a cross-section of the vertebra. You can see the difference in the uh, structure of the uh, bone uh, It's osteoporotic here on your right compared to the normal. 
That's osteoporosis, bone aging. Much more susceptible to fractures. This is the result. To a great extent, I think we can prevent that now with exercise and the dysphosphonates if we get on them early enough. Brain function. This is where we live. <clears throat> we have a decline in performance in a number of cognitive tests, but I want to emphasize that dementia is not part of normal aging. It's a disease. There are many different types of dementia. But <clears throat> if we look at the tasks that we tend to have trouble with in the normal aging, they're uh, not the ones that require experience or judgment. We do have slight decline, normal decline in uh, short-term memory. In some studies, uh, cognitive performance can be improved by exercise. And I think we have a number of studies now that show that exercise is probably the single most important intervention in preserving brain function. And you would think it would be by exercising your brain, doing puzzles and stuff like that. That's been kind of disappointing. It uh, really hasn't uh, stopped the decline in the memory of people that have uh, dementias. When we look at the aging brain, on the right, you'll see the normal brain. Try not to show this before lunch, but uh, you'll notice that the uh, the gyri are, are kind of full. There's not much space in between. In the aging brain, you can see the atrophy. On the CT scans, it can be quite dramatic. Almost 20 to 25 percent of the volume of the brain is lost. But you think, gee, these people must be demented. They must have a severe impairment of their brain. But it doesn't seem to correlate with the amount of shrinkage of the brain. Many of the people test, most of them, that have brain atrophy test normal. So just normal aging doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have dementia. But this is commonly what we will see on a CT scan this morning. So, Going back to the Navy's twin study, or database, I should say, uh, the heritability of cognitive function in Navy's twins was rather prominent. Not unsuspected. You know, if you've got a smart twin, you think you'd be pretty smart too. But the rate of change in their decline in function as we looked at these identical twins was not the same, it didn't hurt I think that's more evidence that this is not a normal process of aging. Hearing, I think one of our stereotypes is the elder person has trouble with hearing, and we all yell at them. And we do have about a 39% decline in hearing in those over age 75, 39% of the hearing impairment seems to be very, very common. And some of it is normal aging. Much of it is related to damage from noise, noise and just hearing loss. In the eyes, we get the hardening of the lenses, the cataracts, we get diminished night vision. We also lose the absolute number of taste buds. And the food becomes more Land, which may be one of the reasons we like more devices as we get older. My grandmother always had so much salt in her food, you could hardly eat it at Thanksgiving. But that's the way she could taste her food. Now, briefly, we'll look at the immune system. T cell function uh, gets a decrease in the proliferative response to uh, infectious stimuli. There's a decreased response to interleukin-2, at least in vitro. There's a decreased level of specific antibody response, decreased auto, or an increased number of autoantibodies, and there's an increased susceptibility to infection overall because of these changes. And there really doesn't seem to be much we can do about that. Immunization certainly helped, 
I would encourage all of you as you age to make sure you do get your flu vaccine, your pneumonia vaccine, your shingles vaccine, and we're recommending tetanus and pertussis, pertussis vaccines. We see pertussis now uh, not uncommonly in elders in our clinics. So, uh, sort of summarizing what I'm talking about, aging is associated with just increased vulnerability to disease in general. There's a decreased ability to maintain that homeostasis. Just trying to keep things normal is more and more difficult. The functional residual capacity of each organ gradually decreases, but decreases at different rates. The aging process is not a disease. I think it's just normal and inevitable. Uh, but disability is not necessarily inevitable. I didn't talk about healthy lifespan. I think other people haven't talked about that too. I didn't talk about exercise as an intervention for aging and something I hope that will be covered later on. So, as Mark Twain said, aging is mine over matter. You know mine? It doesn't matter. <laughs> I mind, so I'm doing everything I can to prevent it. I'd like to live a healthy lifespan and like my grandmother did, just not wake up one morning. She had no, uh, no morbidity at all. Wouldn't that be nice? Questions? Comments? Yes. Exercise and cognition. Yeah, we do have studies that show that uh, regular physical exercise does uh, doesn't prevent uh, a normal decline, but it does uh, slow it down and it prevents some evidence that it may prevent dementia, particularly vascular dementia. I don't know about Alzheimer's. There are many, many different types of dementia. Not everything is Alzheimer's sort of wander everything into the Alzheimer's category. And we have vascular dementia, we have Alzheimer's dementia, we have normal pressure hydrocephalus, Lewy body dementia, we can go on and on. But for some reason exercise seems to protect that brain. Like it protects other organs. Whereas there's a decreased risk of cardiovascular events, strokes and heart attacks when people that exercise regularly. So that makes sense. We weren't designed to be sedentary. We didn't evolve to sit in front of a screen and work on our electronic medical records. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what I do all day. I have to hire a guy to make me exercise three times a week. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. And, and being human below the line. Well, uh, you know, in your daily life, I think you can experience that too. Uh, think of it in, th in this way. If you uh, were a swimmer or an athlete when you were in high school, and you were able to uh, execute a certain swimming event in 30 seconds, would you be able to do that today? Now, would you be able to? No, you couldn't, of course. But if you trained and tried to get yourself in the best condition, could you do it today? No. You could. You could get pretty close. But you'll never get back because that functional reserve has been diminishing. That's why, if you think about the Senior Olympics, I don't know if many of you know about the Senior Olympics. Very interesting. Some of these athletes are really serious about it. And I mean, we've got 60-year-old pole vaulters, 90-year-old uh, weightlifters, very competitive. 
But each age category has is split out because of that loss of functional reserve. The guys that are younger, <clears throat> the women that are younger, have unfair advantage because they got more capacity. No matter how much you train, you're never going to get past that. So we have broken it out into age groups. So you'll say <clears throat> younger people say. I won the 400 meter dash, or the 400 meters, uh, over in Houston a couple weeks ago. I didn't, one of my trainer did. But he's in the uh, 60 to 65 category. Uh, if he was in the 10 year younger category, he wouldn't want it. These guys are really competitive, they really train. He's real serious. You have one other question up here on the. Okay. I was wondering if you have uh, those references are in, the, in your slide, in your presentation? Yes, I do. So, okay, so and that will be on the CD? Yes. I, yes. I don't know. Do we have a references on? The question is, are there references? Are there references on the CD? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right, thank you. I don't think I've gotten one of those CDs. Will I get one this year? Yes. Okay. Yes? Um, given that our immune system decreases as we age, and then with immunizations, uh, should we, do we have a false sense of security sometimes? Should we do, do titer levels to make sure, what, what would you recommend? Or? The question is, uh, since we have a diminished uh, immunologic uh, reserve, should we be measuring titers after our immunizations to see if they really took? Well, we do that with uh, hepatitis. You, know, you can get the hepatitis B vaccine, we get a series of three, then uh, we check to see if you converted, and that would be one of those that didn't convert. I don't know if that means my immune system is uh, impaired in some fashion, probably is. But from a logistical point of view, it's not cost effective to do that. <clears throat> so to answer your question, if we measure the immunologic response to each of our vaccines, would we go back and revaccinate those that didn't respond? And would we find that they responded the second or third time? May not. So it's not cost effective. <clears throat> and then you want to take into consideration that concept of herd immunity. You only need to immunize about 70 to 80% of the population to prevent the spread of an infectious disease. That's why we can get away with <clears throat> some folks not, not being immunized for certain infectious diseases and <clears throat> it doesn't affect the entire population. It's called herd immunity, H E R D. Does that make sense? Is there any benefit of taking is there any benefit in taking what? Omega-3 fatty acid or fish? Uh, fish oil. Is there any benefit in taking fish oil? Uh, well, you might make your breath smell kind of fishy. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's why they have uh, low bonds, and they say that doesn't make your breath smell fishy. There was a large meta-analysis of studies published not too long ago. I don't have the reference on the top of my head. But the uh, findings showed that there was not a decrease in cardiovascular events uh, taking omega-3 fatty acids. It did make your triglycerides look better, lowered the fatty acids in the bloodstream. So it looked prettier on the lab test report. But the ultimate outcomes in terms of does it decrease strokes and heart attacks was, yeah, it really didn't. So I think there's a uh, tendency now, based on that meta-analysis, not to use uh, omega fatty acids. Probably doesn't do any harm. If your wife doesn't mind. Does it have an effect on aging? Don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Um, Jury's out. But there's so many other confounding variables. The Japanese uh, are on a uh, more of a 
fish diet than we are, but um, and they do live longer. But is it societal? Is it uh, environmental? Uh, I don't know. There are too many confounding variables to, to really say that. It's sort of like, uh, well, you know, the Europeans drink a lot of red wine. And they, uh, they, they seem to live a little longer. They have fewer coronary events. They have more lung cancer, too, than smoke on. Uh, too many confounding variables when you're looking at that demographic data that make any distinct, uh, specific, I think, uh, you know, conclusions. Hard thing to say. That's why we use all the animals in the labs. Well, thank you. Appreciate your attention. Uh, wonderful topics we had. We've got some really great speakers coming up. I wish I could attend all of them. Thank you very much. <laughs>